today in this talk. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about a rationale for why should we ask or screen um, our women patients about intimate partner violence. And I will add that the emphasis of this talk will be on um, screening women patients, primarily because that's where most of the research has been done uh, up to this point. I'm fully aware that there are also male victims of domestic violence, but we simply don't have uh, a research base at this point yet to guide us. Um, and so I don't want to really get into that and give uh, wrong information. So I'm going to stick with uh, screening uh, female patients. So we're going to talk about a rationale. We're going to talk a little bit about um, a little controversy in the field. Should we screen everybody? Or should we uh, only ask those patients who show, seem to show signs or symptoms of intimate partner violence or show risk factors for it? And then I'm going to talk some about uh, the evolution of the field. Uh, where did we start and where have we gotten to at this point? Um, how have things changed over time? And then finally, I'm going to describe uh, a model that uh, my colleagues and I here at the Medical College of Wisconsin uh, developed called Healthcare Can Change From Within, uh, which is a system modification program to facilitate uh, screening and intervention in, in primary care settings. So by way of, hmm, I thought I had control of my computer and I'm clicking to move to the next slide and it's not. So what do I have to do? Help? Um, all right, for some reason I'm unable to um, advance slides. So I wonder if I could get um. just a little a little hand here. Yeah, uh, let's see. You can advance your slides. And, uh, no. Let me see if I can. Uh, can you close that out and bring it back on? Actually, I can't. Let me see here. So I've got this piece up. I'm hitting escape. So it says, do I want to leave the webinar? I really don't, right? So. Yes. So uh, let's see. It, can you um, can you click on your on your web on your um, see where your PowerPoint is at the bottom? Yeah. Click on that and see what happens to it. That should. Let's see if that works. Sorry, folks. That we actually there made this go. work the other day. There we go. Okay, can it can it work now? Can you? Well, it's 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 thinking about it. Let me just there see here. All right, so I want to get rid of this. Oh my gosh. That's okay. All right, so this is one of these things that happens when you do. Sometimes when you do a talk, is whatever you think is going to happen doesn't. So hmm. All right. Not what, sure. we, what we can do is that I can. Uh, I have a copy of your presentation, and I can put it up on my screen. And okay. Then you're gonna have to tell me. Um, you're gonna have to tell me when to uh, when to go through the uh, when to go okay. th through the okay. through the slides. All right. Is okay. that? Am I gonna be able to see the slides to be able to tell you that? Yeah, hold on one second. I'm going to do this right now and let me see if I can let me see if we can get it done. We're going to we're going to work with this right now. So, no not okay. a big deal. Okay, here we go. I'm going to make me presenter. Hmm. Here we go. Okay. Part of my problem, I can't seem to get rid of this screen. Let me see if I go to can you see my screen? Let me see. See, I got the problem is I have this thing here that says what's new in PowerPoint Mac, and it won't let me get out of that. Here, maybe this will help. Maybe this will do it. Okay, now I have that. Now I'm seeing a little picture of me on the screen. There you go. Can you see? There. Okay, so, all right. So. Why should we screen? Let's go to that next slide, please. 
And again, I apologize for this. Um, wish I knew what was happening here. So that's it. So let's start, go back to the why should we screen? Couple more slides back. Okay, so so let's talk a little bit right now about a rationale for um, intimate partner violence screening. So next slide. And the, the, the rationale, it, I have the advantage of, I've been in this field for about over 30 years and, and in the early years of trying to talk to physicians and nurses about screening for intimate partner violence, we often got a lot of pushback because we did not have a lot of evidence to support uh, the medical basis, if you will, for screening for intimate partner violence. And we often appealed to their better selves to say this is the right thing to do for your patients, but we didn't necessarily have any evidence to support why this should be. But over the last 30 years, a mountain of evidence has really accrued that demonstrates not only the injuries associated with intimate partner violence, but also the mental and physical health um, implications and sequelae of intimate partner violence as well, and that and the impact of that on healthcare utilization. I'm not going to spend a lot of time more than what I'm saying about that now uh, on this topic, but I, I included a lot of references uh, in the reference section of this talk. So um, you'll be able to find that kind of information um, as well. Next slide, please. Now, the thing about working in primary care is that patients rarely come to their primary care provider, whether it's a physician or an advanced practice nurse, saying, the reason I'm here today is because of intimate partner violence. Instead, they come with a whole lot of other issues that we think of as disguised presentations of intimate partner violence. For example, next slide. So for example, patients may come in with a mental health problem, maybe depression, maybe anxiety. Primary care physicians will rarely see, or they may see, but will rarely diagnose something like PTSD, often because it simply um, there's not enough time for that in uh, the brief kinds of encounters they have, but they will see depression, anxiety, some kind of substance abuse problem, or they may identify a relationship problem, in, maybe in the form of a sexual dysfunction, or their patient may talk about their partner as having uh, a stress-related issue, they may talk about their partner as being angry or having um, an alcohol or drug problem, those kinds of things. Or the presentation may come in the disguised form of a child behavior problem or suspected child abuse uh, in the primary care setting. Another type of disguised presentation may be some kind of stress-related or quote-unquote functional um, type of uh, health problem, things like headaches or undefined somatic complaints or low back pain and those kinds of things for which a, a, a pathophysiological mechanism cannot be found. Next slide, please. Another f set of, of disguised presentations may be things that we might generically call compliance problems, not filling prescriptions or not taking prescribed medications as, as prescribed, or showing uh, making sporadic visits for obstetrical care, or starting OB care um, later than, um, than the first trimester, which is when you know, most people start their uh, OB care. Or they may fail to follow through on specialty care uh, for some reason. And th these things are frustrating to healthcare providers and they often kind of get lumped into a broad category of non-compliance, uh, but may often be kind of the cover for something else that's going on in a patient's life. Okay, next slide please. And these disguised presentations, which don't get identified as intimate partner violence related, often translate into higher healthcare utilization and costs. So there's also a, a, a literature body now that is starting to build that shows that um, uh, victims of intimate partner violence uh, use more healthcare services and that even after the violence ends, that the, uh, the utilization continues at a higher rate, even as much as five years um, after the cessation of violence. 
Next slide, please. And the other part of this is that uh, children of uh, abused women also experience more health care and more health care costs than children of non-abused women. And that's across the full spectrum of, of the health care um, service system where, where we might see in the emergency department the only place where kids might be directly impacted, where a kid is caught in, you know, in between and is physically harmed, but, but they make more visits in other uh, sections as well of the health care system. Next slide, please. Okay, so I've talked kind of in the abstract about how um, patients may present in a disguised form. I want to now, in, in a figurative way, put a face to some of these um, more abstract examples by sharing with you um, some case examples of, of just, you know, how patients may present to a, a family doctor setting or family medicine setting. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide, please. So this first case, we'll call her KC, um, this would be a, a, a presentation that was ultimately determined to be acute stress disorder. So, but she came to her family doctor and the, the, with a very, very typical um, presentation in a primary care clinic. I'm having problems sleeping, I'm feeling stressed all the time, I'm depressed. So next slide, family doctor did um, an assessment and determined that this patient was anxious and depressed and needed to see a psychologist and, and referred her to me. Next slide, please. So here's what she did not say to her family doctor. So she did not say that the weekend before this doctor visit that at a family gathering her um, husband punched and strangled her and, and she thought she was going to die. She, she was really, really scared. And since that time, Part of the reason she couldn't sleep or couldn't concentrate on work is she couldn't get the image of um, him coming at her and strangling her out of her head. Um, she also then began withdrawing and avoiding situations that reminded her of the, of the trauma as well. Um, things like not going to the health club because she knew she would see people there who knew her husband, for example, or not wanting to talk to her family members uh, who called to express concern and support, but every time she talked to them, it, it brought up the imagery again, and so she just wanted to try to avoid all of that. Next slide, please. Okay, another, this, this would be a, a disguised presentation of depression. So this patient is a 55-year-old woman who uh, was in a long-term marriage, worked part-time at her church. She was a frequent clinic visitor. She, had, she and her doctor had difficulty getting her blood pressure under control. She struggled with headaches, and she also struggled with depression. So after a suitable course of attempting to modify and alter medication regimens and so forth. Next slide, please. The doctor um, who was trained to ask about domestic violence decided to take a step back and ask some questions about uh, what else was going on in her life, including some very direct questions about intimate partner violence. And in the course of this, um, she acknowledged that um, her partner uh, was converting to a different religion and, and he saw himself as the spiritual head of household and demanded that she follow along and when she resisted he would use physical force against her and intimidation as strategies to try to get her to change her mind. But that did not come out um, until she was asked. Next slide please. Okay, this is a, a, an interesting um, scenario as well. So this would be a, a case of what we might call a functional disorder. So this is a, a young woman who was currently unemployed with a history of bipolar disorder and alcohol abuse, as you can see. But she didn't come into the clinic for that. She came in because she was suffering from low back pain. Her doctor did every kind of test that was appropriate to do to try to figure out the underlying pathophysiological mechanism of it or the underlying mechanical mechanism of um, her back pain. Next slide. And when all of these tests came back negative, decided to, to again ask about what else was going on in this patient's life, you know, including intimate partner violence. And this is when she acknowledged it. And the story here was that um, she, had, she had lived in another state 
and she met this guy. They met actually in an inpatient psychiatric facility when she was being treated for bipolar and decided to live together when they got out. So they moved in together and at some point down the line he tried to kill her with a baseball bat. He was put in prison for a number of years and she surreptitiously left that state and moved to um, Wisconsin. And at some point um, she received a letter from him, even though she never told him and told very few people that she was leaving. He managed to figure out where she was, sent her a letter basically telling her, you're mine and when I get out of prison, I'm going to come and get you. Um, and that's when, what prompted her to come into the doctor. So next case, please. Okay, and this, this is a, a, a case of anxiety, how anxiety may be a disguise for uh, intimate partner violence. So this uh, was, is also a woman who's been married a fair long time. Um, of, of note is that she recently was experiencing an empty nest. Her youngest adult child had recently moved out, and she took a job part-time working in a deli at a local grocery store. Uh, but then she began to be really anxious and would come to her primary care doctor um, for help and treatment with the anxiety. And he had tried a number of medications and tried increasing doses and, and those kinds of things. Um, and she still continued to be very anxious. So he um, asked me to come into a visit with them um, to see if we could put our heads together and figure out what was going on. So next slide, please. So during that visit, um, we, you know, we kind of apprehended that she had this uncontrollable worry that something bad might be you know, was going to happen to her um, that she did not or could not verbalize, and she had a lot of symptoms of generalized anxiety. At one point, she began to cry; tears welled up in her eyes, and I asked her what those tears meant, and she then told the story, and the story was that. In the early years of their marriage, prior to children, her husband would batter her regularly on a weekly basis and during these beatings would say to her things like, I am the boss, don't ever go against my word. So fast forward 30 years and she has this job. She then initiates a conversation with her husband about hey, um, now that I'm making some money, I'd like to use some of that to buy a used car, and that way I can get to work and back myself. I don't have to depend on you. And he kind of looked at her and said, I don't think that's a good idea. And when he said that, uh, all of the coercion and control that she experienced throughout marriage all just came to a head and uh, triggered the anxiety, and that's what brought her into the doctor. Okay, next slide, please. So... All of these cases that I shared with you were to illustrate the um, disguised presentation of intimate partner violence at a primary health care setting, to illustrate the point that patients almost never come to a primary care provider to, and say right from the outset, my presenting problem is intimate partner violence. And so we identified these, uh, these cases through a process that um, we case finding, that is the doctor identified some kind of sign or set of symptoms that made them concerned that there could be something else going on, including domestic violence, and so they then um, proceeded to ask about it. Um, and there, another approach is to just ask all women patients who come into a healthcare setting uh, whether or not they're in, you know, is, is safe in their relationship and if somebody is kidding them or hurting them. Uh, in some way. And so that is that is called universal screening. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to be honest and say I'm an advocate of both. I think we should ask all women um, about intimate partner violence at least once a year when they come in for an annual uh, or they come in for some other extended kind of visit. But we should also, as primary health providers, be um, knowledgeable about signs and symptoms which may have limited uh, sensitivity or specificity, but which may still point in a direction of intimate partner violence. And so if we're sensitive to those things, then we should be ready to ask about uh, it, IPV when we start we'll sort of see those, um, those signs and symptoms. But the nature of the debate is that 
um, screening, a couple of large randomized controlled trials have not shown screening to be more effective than not screening in identifying um, abuse victims and in particular in showing decreases in um, uh, violence or increases in, in, in health status um, as a result. Um, so, the, so the argument is because we haven't shown uh, screening to be highly effective, maybe, you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing screening. Instead, we should be looking for signs and symptoms and be prepared to ask when we see those. The problem that I see with that logic is that when we take a look at these, these trials that have been done, what we find is what's fairly typical in research on you know, intimate partner violence in healthcare settings, and that is whether one is assigned to the experimental group or to the control group, if during the course of follow-up um, a, a research participant identifies as having, having been um, abused, then there are um, kind of research-based protocols for, uh, for protecting the safety of participants that look an awful lot like clinic-based interventions for intimate partner violence. In other words, then the, re the participant receives emotional support, typically receives um, information about uh, community resources for domestic violence. Uh, they may be given a little extra time uh, to sort of work through the crisis that they may be experiencing at that time and so on. So it's, so it's an actually a very humane and appropriate intervention. Well, the problem is then it becomes confounded with the uh, experimental intervention, and so it's really hard to know exactly what is going on. The other side of the argument is, you know, in terms of waiting to see signs and symptoms that, that might point to intimate partner violence, such as we saw in these cases that I showed you, um, is that not all um, victims of domestic violence suffer from depression or anxiety or um, uh, uncontrolled hypertension or headaches or low back pain. And so those, those signs and symptoms tend to characterize or differentiate abuse victims when we do large group studies, but at the same time, they tend to not be very sensitive or specific for domestic violence as, as well. So if we wait for signs and symptoms, uh, we may be missing a lot of opportunities to identify intimate partner violence. So, so again, I'm, I'm actually a fan of doing both. Next slide, please. Okay, then there are, there are a number of other factors that support um, and forces that support universal screening for intimate partner violence in healthcare settings. One is the Affordable Care Act. When the Affordable Care Act was written, they included IPV screening and counseling of women um, and adolescents for that matter um, as one of eight prevention services that would be offered to women with no cost sharing. And so in other words, a clinic can choose to do intimate partner violence screening and, and they can submit uh, billing to insurance for that, but uh, can, cannot ask the patient to make a copay as well. So it's, it, 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 there's uh, certainly incentives for screening um, for intimate partner violence. Next slide. And the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has also, oops, go back one. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has also um, um, determined that uh, intimate partner violence screening should be offered and that it has at least a moderate net benefit resulting in a, a grade of B, a B recommendation. Um, and they base this on the fact that they identified a number of adequate, psychometrically adequate screening instruments for identifying intimate partner violence, as well as uh, finding adequate evidence of effective interventions with abuse victims once they have been identified. Plus, they, they determined that screening for intimate partner violence poses no more than a small risk to the well-being of the patient. Next slide, please. Actually, skip to the next one as well. So, speaking of screening instruments, um, so I, I just I'm not going to spend a lot of time with these because of time constraints. But again, I've included all of these in the reference section for those of you who want to follow up and identify a screening instrument that you may want to or consider uh, implementing in your own healthcare setting. So, these are the six. Um, instruments that the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force identified as having a sufficiently appropriate um, uh, psychometric qualities for screening. Most of them were, have been developed for use in 
um, primary care settings. The PVS was developed for use in emergency department settings, but has also been adapted in primary care settings. And they range from two, two items to six items, so they're very brief. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, so now let's talk about, uh, for a while, about prior efforts to enhance intimate partner violence screening. So, they're, they're, again, I've got the, the long view here, been around doing this for a number of years, and, and I've been able to sort of see how things have evolved. And it's, it's kind of an interesting history. So, in general, um, the, the problems, the major problems that we've seen with efforts to get doctors and nurses to ask patients about intimate partner violence is that, that these interventions have rarely been have led to large-scale changes uh, in screening in medicine and healthcare, and they've also, if they even if they've shown some promise, are often not have not been sustainable. So we'll talk about why that might be in a minute here. Next slide, please. So, for example, uh, there have been a number over the years of external attempts to uh, induce uh, healthcare providers to screen, and, and they've just really not been very effective. Uh, examples would include um, virtually every uh, health organization, such as APA or the AMA, and every subspecialty uh, organization, and every nursing organization has published position papers um, saying, yes, domestic violence is a major uh, public health problem and we all need to screen and ask our patients about it, but yet that hasn't really resulted in any large-scale um, cultural change in healthcare uh, to do that. There have been accreditation efforts as well. So, for example, uh, JACO uh, in 1992 came out with uh, uh, rules for accreditation that healthcare agencies had to have policies and procedures for screening. Um, and then a few years later, they kind of upped the ante a little and said, not only do you have to have uh, policies and procedures, but you have to demonstrate at the site visit with some random chart audits that um, that screening is also happening. And that may have resulted in some um, more screening uh, occurring, but, but not any really high levels. Um, and then some states, a couple of states, actually required physicians to receive intimate partner violence screening training as, as part of a requirement for licensure renewal. Now, there have been some promising um, uh, efforts as well that, that have shown more um, effectiveness and promise. And that generally has been in the form of health systems collaborating with local advocacy agencies to, um, uh, to implant or embed um, an, an advocate in the healthcare setting to be there to do some training, but to also be available as an in-house warm referral uh, to patients who identify as being abused. So when that person is in-house, um, it's been shown that um, screening goes up, as does re identification and referral. But th there's a couple problems that, that have also come along with that, and that is, first of all, that m there, there simply are not enough uh, domestic violence advocates to go around to every um, health setting. And so typically what we've seen in these kinds of um, demonstration projects is that they would be embedded in an emergency department, but not in any other system in, in the healthcare system. Um, and there's just, again, not enough uh, resources to go around. And, and secondly, typically when those projects come to an end, if they're grant supported, then the, the, the intervention ends as well. The advocate goes back to the advocacy program and the program does not continue. Next. Next slide, please. Thanks. Okay, so there have been a number of training and education efforts um, as well with the thinking that if we train doctors and nurses how to ask competently about domestic violence and how to respond, that they will um, all, they will then go back to their work settings and will um, do this work. Next slide, please. Thanks. So, and, and we know that we, what we have found from this research is that training is effective in, in changing the knowledge base of the practitioner as well as their sense of self-efficacy that, hey, this is something that not only should I do because I'm a healthcare provider, but I'm also now capable of doing it. And some studies of, who have, that have been able to look at clinical skill have also been able to show that 
training increases actual clinical skill in um, interacting with patients around the issue of intimate partner violence. Next slide, please. But when we take a, a, a step back and look at the bigger picture of this literature, what we find is that even though healthcare providers learn and become more skillful um, in, in asking about and intervening with domestic violence, unfortunately, uh, they often don't actually do that work in their clinical setting. So we see education as being necessary, but not sufficient. And so a, an example of this comes from uh, the Minsky Kelly et al. study, which I was a part of, and so next slide, please, which in which we trained almost 800 healthcare providers um, uh, uh, in, you know, in three and in four-hour workshops on uh, intimate partner violence and training and how to screen and so on, and then six months after we did an assessment of how much screening was actually happening in the key departments that we trained, and found some very sporadic findings with one department close to the target, two departments seemingly making progress, but some departments not doing any screening at all, despite the, uh, the gains that these people made as a result of training. Next slide. So it raised the question in our mind, why is this? Why, how is it that we can train doctors and nurses up to a, a level of competency and skill and yet they're still not doing this work in their settings. So we convened a series of focus groups with uh, providers who had been through the training and um, in, in key departments and we, and we asked them those questions. Why, why isn't, what, what's getting in the way of you doing that? Next slide, please. And, and we identified a number of barriers. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, there we go. We identified a number of barriers that uh, healthcare providers told us that they encountered um, that, that have to be addressed. So things like privacy concerns. Some departments, such as emergency departments, may do screening in a triage setting where it's not exactly private. There may be all kinds of people milling around. Um, or there, other departments, other providers told us about time constraints. I only have X minutes with a patient and, um, and I've got to keep the things moving and that relates then to patient flow. That there are only so many exam rooms in this clinic and they, they need to keep moving at a certain pace and if, if somebody has a crisis um, and we need to spend the time with them, which we want to do, then that backs everything else up and that causes problems. Um, some people um, indicated that despite the training that they received, continued to have personal and professional discomfort with the subject matter. We, this relates to another survey that we did of uh, medical students where we found that about 15, between 15 and 18 percent of medical students told us that they had experienced um, sufficient family violence in their own lives, including abuse, child abuse, but also witnessing parental violence, maybe violence in their own adult relationships, where they simply felt that they would not be able to help somebody else who had that problem. So we think maybe some of that was also going on here with the professional and personal discomfort. Next slide, please. And so in this particular setting, we then set about trying to do some system changes. And, uh, and so what we did was work with departments that had concerns about privacy level, and work with problem solving how to increase privacy. With patient flow issues, how to maybe identify or set aside a room for use for uh, crisis management you know, or uh, other intervention, with brief intervention with a patient who identified um, IPV. Or at another modific or another intervention was to do um, department level uh, continuous quality improvement studies and give them ongoing feedback. Departments really like these kinds of things because it, it tells them where they are relative to some benchmark and they're always striving to achieve benchmarks. So and some departments uh, dealt with a lot of trauma and so there was a, a sense that they that the personnel there might benefit from some burnout management or some other kind of, um, of intervention. And then finally, uh, we developed some ongoing brief in-service skills training to be able to review what the, the mission and goals were of, of you know, the partner violence screening across um, all departments. And what we found, next slide please, 
Next slide, please. Okay, so what we found, and I'm going to go through these next three slides fairly quickly, but what we found was that after we began implementing interventions, that we saw fairly high levels of, of, of increases in screening. Next slide. So one, one emergency department, this was the OB department that had been doing no screening uh, following training, and then the third slide. And the third slide represents the second emergency department that was part of the system, and, and they continued to struggle with screening. Um, so, and we were never really quite sure why that was. Uh, but what it did do for us as investigators and workers in this area was to rethink um, the, the primacy of emergency departments as the primary point of entry for identifying uh, domestic violence victims in the healthcare system and, and suggested to us that we really do need to broaden the scope of this um, to get into other departments including primary care. Okay, next slide please. Now the, um, but the other side of that is that these these system level interventions did seem to have a positive benefit and so this, I just want to acknowledge my uh, working group uh, all of my partners in this um, uh, this project that we've been working on uh, with this healthcare can change from within model, um, and it, this got us to thinking, you know, how can we change the system um, without necessarily uh, 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 going with um, ex external forces that might impose change and then disappear when funding leaves and so on, and instead find something that might be more permanent by, you know, kind of working within the system to find changes. Next slide, please. So um, this is the healthcare can change from within model in, in brief, and I'm going to go over each one of these things and talk about um, how these um, relate to uh, making system changes that may be sustainable. So first of all, uh, in any health setting, uh, healthcare providers and professionals play multiple roles. So, for example, um, an RN may work the floor with a physician in uh, treating patients who come in on a regular basis, but that RN may also uh, be the clinic expert on diabetes management and so may be called upon to meet with selected patients time to time to work on um, issues related to managing their diabetes more effectively. Another nurse might be the expert on, um, local expert on asthma, and so they may play that role with patients and so on in addition to their regular role. So we conceived of the idea that, that there may, there, there, there's room for multitasking uh, in a healthcare setting in, a, in the way of training selected staff to become domestic violence experts and advocates within the clinic. That way uh, we, we have that expertise developed from within and we don't have to necessarily rely on funding to support the embeddedness of, of, a, of an advocate from an outside agency and risk losing that advocate if funding priorities change and so on. So we did collaborate and we do advocate collaborating actively with the local agency. So this is not about health systems going it alone. Um, the, ad, the, the advocacy agency within the community plays a very important role in all of this in, in terms of well, it, we work with them to develop appropriate training and to train staff to the level of a domestic violence advocate uh, who might be going to work for that agency. Um, we, also, the, the, we also collaborated with the advocacy uh, group to provide ongoing consultation and we had ongoing relationships with them to facilitate warm referrals from the clinic uh, to the advocacy agency as needed. Another component of this that we thought was both unique and important is that, not, is that prior to this point, um, most of the training initiatives that you see in the literature have been to train physicians and nurses to ask patients about domestic violence and, and no one else in the health setting um, was involved, but we believe that if we're going to be changing the very nature of the system to address intimate partner violence as a health issue, that um, that the, the, that everybody needed to be on board with this, and so all staff, um, even staff that 
did relatively little work with directly with patients were trained in the area of domestic violence. And another um, benefit to this is that is the recognition that even within health settings, um, there may be many staff people who are themselves struggling with the issue, and so this became um, a way for the system to also communicate care about this issue to their employees so and give them information that they could access as needed. Another component is uh, policies and procedures. Um, so those are the lifeblood of most healthcare organizations, and so um, as such, um, we it, the healthcare advocates uh, were in charge of overseeing policy and procedure development for things like screening. How often does it happen? Who does that screening? When does it happen? What kind of visits does it happen? Um, and so on. Um, then there was a, another continuous quality uh, improvement piece that was included, as well as primary prevention. Just a couple of words on primary prevention. We developed some pamphlets on healthy relationships and uh, fair fighting techniques that were to be handed out to uh, all patients who screened negative for intimate partner violence. So it was like, you know, congratulations that you're in a, in a relationship that is not violent, and here's some information that can make your relationship even better. And we also placed those pamphlets out in waiting rooms uh, for patients to just access on their own. And what was really interesting about this is that, that, that those pamphlets just kept leaving like hotcakes. I mean, we simply um, were not able to keep up with the demand for them. Um, and one of our regrets is that we never uh, quantified that for purposes of our evaluation. Okay, next um, slide, please. Okay, I want to talk just a little bit about training healthcare providers to ask about and respond to intimate partner violence because even though I mentioned earlier that it's it's not sufficient, it is necessary. And I've learned a few things about uh, training healthcare providers over the years that I just wanted to share with you. Um, next slide, please. Probably the most important thing that um, that anyone can do when they're going to talk to healthcare providers about intimate partner violence is to tailor the training to the specific audience that you're working with. So, for example, rather than give kind of a general, what I call DV 101 lecture, tr try to develop a, a lecture or a workshop that really focuses on the issues and concerns of a particular setting. So primary care, for example, is different than obstetrics, um, which is different than uh, emergency. And so there's, there are literatures out there on things like prevalence and typical presentations and um, health concerns of patients in all of these different settings. And it's very important to try to incorporate those uh, uh, discipline-specific uh, data into your talks. Next um, slide, please. So in addition to training um, doctors and nurses how to ask about intimate partner violence, um, we also uh, focus in and spend a lot of time on what to do afterwards. And this is based on a lot of feedback that we have um, received over the years in which uh, people have told us, you know, it's very easy to ask. I, I feel comfortable asking about domestic violence. Where the problem comes in is I don't know what to do once the patient says yes. So we've identified in, in work we, research that we've done with um, survivors of domestic violence seven intervention components that, that we think are really key um, to include in training and for providers to have. Uh, skill in uh, when they do this work. <clears throat> so the first is uh, assuring confidentiality. Um, intimate partner violence survivors, like trauma survivors generally, are very reluctant to disclose uh, information because they, fe they fear that once they disclose it, they will lose all control of it. And indeed, uh, in the past, um, there have been well-meaning um, providers who have taken information about domestic violence to the perpetrator with the express purpose of trying to get the perpetrator to stop their bad behavior. And that results oftentimes in more violence toward uh, the survivor. So it's very important to assure confidentiality. Now, some of you may work in a state where intimate partner violence uh, is a mandatory reporting 
um, issue. And, and so you have to, if somebody tells you about intimate partner violence, you have to report it to some authority. Um, and so if that's the case, then it, of course, prior to asking about intimate partner violence, it's really appropriate to tell your patient that, um, that depending on the answers given, uh, you may have to make a report so that they at least have informed consent. Another key intervention component is providing emotional support. And this, for, for, for a healthcare provider, is not something unusual. Um, it's simply provide, giving an empathic statement. Sometimes something like, I'm very sorry this has happened to you. You deserve to be safe and respected in your relationship. You, um, you, you don't deserve to have this happen to you. Thank you for your courage for um, sharing this with me. Those kinds of things. So providing emotional support is very important. Providing community resource information is also very important. It could be in the form of pamphlets, although not all survivors are, are, feel safe taking that kind of material home, but it could be gone over in the clinic setting uh, or it can be discussed with them. Danger assessment and safety planning, those are things that may be a little unique to this and not something that the typical uh, healthcare provider does on a regular basis. But danger assessment could be as straightforward as administering uh, Jackie Campbell's danger assessment form to kind of get a sense of the severity of the violence and the risk that this person is facing. Safety planning is something that is a process and it could be started with a simple question of do you feel safe going home today? So offering follow-up, and usually what we stress there is um, if somebody's revealing domestic violence during an annual visit, to not say to them something like, hey, um, come back in a year, I'll see you in a year, but rather I want to see you in a couple of weeks, and then appropriate documentation. So these are the, the seven key intervention components. And the physician in our, in our model or nurse may be the one who does that, or they may refer uh, bring in the, the local expert, the health advocate, uh, to spend time with the patient um, going through these things as well. Next slide, please. So I'm going to share with you now a couple of cases just to illustrate how this works. So the first case is that a couple came into the clinic and they each had their own appointment. Next slide. And the male checked in for both himself and his partner. This in and of itself is very typical in um, family medicine settings. So it's not, you know, nothing, uh, nothing unusual. However, while the male was checking in, another receptionist uh, in the office happened to notice some things that raised some red flags for her. He noticed that he was doing all the talking. He noticed also that the partner was giving off some nonverbals that suggested that she um, was you know, maybe not uh, feeling autonomous in that situation. And he was also fairly rude and aggressive with the reception staff. And then she also noticed bruising, which would be the next case, uh, next slide. She also noticed bruising um, on the um, arms of the uh, female patient. Next slide. So the receptionist um, decided that she needed to communicate her concerns to the medical assistant uh, who was going to be working with a physician and rooming these patients. And so she communicated her concerns um, and her observations. And next slide. Um, and then the medical assistant decided that she would room this couple separately, which does not always happen automatically in primary care clinics. And so, but w this clinic had developed a specific policy that every patient would be seen for part of their visit um, alone, and, and that was the policy that she was going by. So she then roomed them separately. Then, next slide, she went to the physician uh, and, and told him what was going on. And so he knew what, you know, what to expect. And then he began to see the female patient while she roomed the male patient in a non-adjacent room. And that's significant because even though we think doctors' offices um, are sacrosanct and private, which they generally are, walls are not always soundproof. And, um, and in this particular cl clinic, that was the case. And so um, this medical assistant um, knew that and wisely roomed the patient uh, the male patient in a different room far enough away so that he couldn't put his ear up against the wall to see what was going on. 
or hear what was going on. In this particular case, um, we, we learned that the patient did not speak English as a first language and needed an interpreter, and that might have accounted for some of her not talking at the front desk. Um, she also de denied that uh, intimate partner violence was going on. But at least it communicated a message to this patient that this is a place where we are concerned about that and, um, and that if she has these concerns in the future, she can bring them up. Next slide, please. Okay, this next case was a young woman who came into the clinic for a complete physical exam. So this was an annual exam, and the policy in that clinic was to ask all patients during a uh, complete exam during the social history about intimate partner violence, and she indicated that, in fact, this was going on in her life. Next. So uh, she then reported to the physician um, a great deal of, of, ser of serious violence and, and uh, threats of violence against her. And so, next. And so she then, um, or the physician then asked her if she wanted to speak with the health advocate, and she indicated she did. So the health advocate then came into the exam room and conducted um, a thorough assessment with her, um, including safety planning and follow-up contacts. Next. And then in this case, the patient also asked for help in accessing a shelter that day. And so the advocate contacted the shelter, was told by whoever she spoke with that there was no room, and the, the person on the other end also did not provide alternatives, which is a little unusual. Usually when a shelter is full and someone calls, they will work with them to find alternative shelter um, resources. So that didn't happen here, and the advocate then uh, took it upon herself to find those alternatives and then later contacted the shelter director to, uh, to do some problem solving around um, you know, make, you know, providing those alternatives, making that a little bit uh, more uh, transparent for uh, future referrals. Okay, next slide. So what are the active components that were, that were at play here? Uh, this, the, these, these two cases actually represent a considerable departure from um, what I call usual care, uh, where um, you know, a receptionist might see, in fact, the receptionist told us during the saturation training that they see domestic violence all the time, but are not uh, often able or don't feel empowered to do anything about it because um, they didn't know that they could tell somebody or who they should tell. Um, so, so these are really uh, interesting departures. So the first component is education, that everybody learned about um, domestic violence and that would be the next slide, education. And you can even skip to the slide after that. So there's education and discipline and job-specific roles. So people knew about, everybody in the clinic knew what domestic violence was and how to deal with it. Within their specific job definition and role, they had, um, uh, they knew what to do. And they could also rely on policies and procedures for guiding their actions. Next slide. So how do we measure effectiveness of healthcare-based domestic violence screening and intervention? So one of the um, uh, early thoughts about this is we're trying to end domestic violence in all of our patients' lives, and that certainly is the goal. Next slide, please. But while that's the, while that's the ultimate goal, one of the things I think that we are learning is that, um, is that Stopping domestic violence is not necessarily under the control of the patient or the health care provider um, themselves. Um, and so we, we need to do other things to provide comfort, support, resource information, and advocacy. So the next slide, please. So we identify three levels of analysis when evaluating um, health care-based screening and intervention programs, practitioner level, health care level, and patient level. And so, and we applied those levels of analyses to um, um, an evaluation of our um, small program. Go ahead. Next slide, please. So let me share a little bit about outcomes. So next slide. Okay, so in terms of practitioner outcomes, we found pretty much what we expected to find and what others have found in the literature as well in terms of improved self-efficacy, improved knowledge uh, about domestic violence and understanding. We also found that the, that the providers also sensed uh, that the clinic had increased capacity 
to facilitate IPV screening and intervention, which was something we hadn't necessarily uh, thought about but certainly hoped for. So the, the system change was obvious to everybody. And by chart audits, via chart audits, we saw increased screening, which actually uh, took place across a two-year, uh, was evident across a two-year follow-up, even after the intervention had ended. Go ahead. Next. In terms of clinic outcomes, we were able to compare two primary care intervention clinics with two usual care clinics, and, and we were able to determine that, um, that the, the intervention clinics were more likely to have um, uh, policies and procedures. They also had much more patient education about um, intimate partner violence uh, around the clinic in different locations, and again, those clinics uh, showed increased screening as documented in the record. And as I mentioned, these changes continued uh, over a two-year follow-up after the funding for the intervention component ended, which suggested to us that these changes uh, were sustained, that the intervention was sustainable. Okay, next. Um, in terms of patient outcomes, um, like the uh, large randomized controlled trials that I uh, cited earlier in the talk, uh, we did not show that patients in the intervention clinics uh, experienced less violence or show, uh, exhibited more safety behaviors than patients in the usual care clinics. But as with those other studies, we, we also found that there was a confounding of uh, some of the methods with uh, the intervention and that uh, in, in follow-up uh, qualitative interviews with patients, uh, we found that, or I mean with participants, we found that, uh, pay, that they all uh, uh, started to rethink their situations uh, simply by being asked frequently over the course of uh, uh, two years or 18 months of follow-up uh, about violence and safety behaviors. And, they, and many of them began implementing safety behaviors, even in the, the usual care conditions, simply because they were being asked about it. Uh, but where we did find significant findings is that um, the page patients or participants in the intervention clinics um, have, uh, reported much more screening um, and discussion of intimate partner violence with a doctor or a nurse. They also exhibited and reported fewer symptoms of injury, um, and they also exhibited um, a, a decline in office visits over, over the 18-month uh, follow-up. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and that was a tiny study. We had two primary care clinics who were intervention clinics, two that were um, control clinics or usual care clinics. So uh, this is a, a, a much larger study done by Gene Fader and his colleagues in England where they used a randomized control um, trial of with, using 48 clinics, but they used components that were very similar to the healthcare can change from within model and essentially found much the same thing that we did with the added finding in another related study that the intervention is also cost effective. So next slide. Finally, in summary, um, so just to, to, to kind of go back over what I've said, so, so intimate partner violence is, is really a, a public health problem. It has tremendous morbidity. Uh, there's now no doubt about the relationship between intimate partner violence and health status um, and diagnoses of all kinds of things uh, in patients who seek health care services. And they, and patients uh, who are struggling with intimate partner violence are high utilizers of healthcare services as well. And, and the efforts to um, screen, identify, and intervene uh, into intimate partner violence in healthcare settings, it continues to be a work in progress, but significant progress has been made with systems change now being the latest piece of this that seems to offer the most promise for uh, developing sustainable and fairly large-scale um, screening. Obviously, the usual caveat, more research needs to be done. Obviously, those t I, I showed you two um, uh, randomized control trials earlier that did not show a particular benefit of screening. So we need to do more uh, to try to figure out you know, where screening fits into the whole picture. And we need to really focus on methodological improvements, things like how do we tease out research protocol-based interventions from 
um, uh, the actual experimental intervention, and so on. So that takes me to the end of the of the talk. Um, I, you will all be receiving a PDF version of this, um, uh, I think, tomorrow. And so it has a, the reference section in there um, that references a lot of the stuff I talked about. It also um, has contact information for me in case you um, have questions beyond today. And I guess this takes us to a question and answer time. Thank you, Kevin. This was awesome. Thank you for being so generous with all your information. Uh, based on your experience and your research, would you advocate more strongly for placing more psychologists in primary care settings or increasing training of medical professionals to screen for interpersonal violence? Um, I don't know if I would see that as an either-or thing, and it's interesting that you should talk about placing more psychologists in primary care settings. I'm, I'm actually working on a sl slightly different permutation of healthcare can change from within, with a focus on IPV, to um, to identify to a more a broader um, trauma-informed care model in primary care settings that really does call for um, the the um, embedding of uh, clinical psychologists, clinical psychologists into the clinic to be able to play that more integrated role. I, I, I myself am uh, placed. I, I've been working in primary care in a primary care clinic for 33 years. Um, I, I don't consider myself to have a fully integrated model. I'm more of a collaborative care person. Although occasionally I am called into service on a on, on kind of an on the spot basis. Uh, but uh, but it would be I think it's really important to have that person here. Um, at the other side of that is I think it's equally important to train healthcare providers to um, to do a lot of the initial screening and and to uh, provide um, uh, again trauma sensitive responses to patients when uh, they reveal that you know they're going through something that you know that's traumatic. Okay. And, Does um, that answer? Is, is, yes. Yeah, sorry. H have you noted any differences when screening women experience interpersonal violence in same-sex relationships? That's a really good question, and it's it's an issue that has not really been well studied. Even in our project, um, we we included um, everybody, um, in, regardless of sexual orientation, in the screening. Um, but in terms of the study, we had such a small sample size that it was not feasible to try to break out um, sexual orientation as um, as a separate variable. So I can't, I really can't answer the question. But uh, but one of the things that we do in our trainings is that because we know that people work in different settings. That um, that they should be mindful. That clinicians should be mindful that intimate partner violence um, occurs with about the same prevalence in um, the LGBT community. And so, in working with sexual minorities, it's important to screen for domestic violence there as well. Thank you. And I think we just have one more um, question. Are there um, any efforts of which you are aware that screen for perpetrators of interpersonal violence in primary care settings? There's there's been some talk about that, um, and it's it, there there's a a, a a general internist named Lee Kimberg, uh, L E I G H Kimberg K I M B E R G. In case somebody wants to Google. Her. And um, she published a paper in the Journal of General Internal Medicine a number of years ago um, on screening men for intimate partner violence. And part of it was um, screening for perpetration, but also part of it was for screening for their own victimization, and not just in intimate partner violence relations, but more generally, because uh, the the uh, criminological um, literature shows us that men are by far and away more likely to be victimized by violence than women generally, but it's usually by other men. So it is certainly appropriate to ask them about um, violence victimization. Uh, the, I think um, healthcare has been a little bit slow to embrace screening for perpetration, in part because um, the whole, I'm just, this is my opinion, but in part because the whole issue of 
intimate partner violence without having that system-based infrastructure that I described is kind of frightening uh, to healthcare providers and can be very disruptive to a day. And so um, if it's scary to ask a patient if they are a victim of violence, it may be even more frightening to ask somebody if they are perpetrating it. So movement has been slow um, in the field in that area. It certainly is something that does get talked about. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I, I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, unless you have uh, any other comments, um, I'm just going to end with uh, thanking you and, and telling about our next uh, webinar. So, Kevin, did you have any final things you wanted to say to the group? Um, no, I, I don't. Other than, again, if anybody you know wants to email me um, I, or contact me by phone, I, that, inf that contact information is um, on the materials that you'll be receiving tomorrow, and I, I welcome those kind of inquiries. Thank you so, so much. Um, You're welcome, yeah. and thank you all. Thank you for your patience with this. I, I'm, I'm very sorry that somehow things went awry, but I'm really glad that we okay. were able, able yeah, to get it back you. together. Um, so I just wanted to announce the next uh, webinar. Um, we are really grateful that Dr. Uh, Matthew Friedman, who is the former director of the VA's National Center for PTSD, and um, his colleague, um, Dr. Nancy Bernardi, were willing to present to us. Matt is actually, as many of you probably know, retired, but um, is, is, is graciously agreed to do this. So Matt and Nancy will be giving uh, a talk on pharmacotherapy for the treatment of PTSD and other trauma-related disorders. Because Matt is retired, he's no longer uh, doing anything on Fridays except having fun. So he agreed graciously to do this talk on Wednesday, uh, March 23rd, at noon, and we will, Jan will get that out to you um, via, via email through our listserv. So that's all I have, Jan and Veronica and Kevin. Anything else we need to say before we can close and help people have a great weekend? No, that is it. Thank you so much, and you will be receiving uh, the copies and links to the CE evaluation and to the uh, webinar evaluation. Uh, by next week, and we hope to see you at the next one. Yeah, thank you everybody. Have a great weekend. What a wonderful division we have. Bye-bye.